Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, Kenya's high court considers so-called safe abortion guidelines. In studio, we're joined by a pro-life leader who says the most dangerous place for an African-American is in the womb. And this. I made a note for President Trump, but I lost it and I can't find it. This four-year-old girl recently caught the attention of the president. Wait until you hear why. But first, our top story, 140 members of the U.S. House of Representatives sent a letter to the Department of Health and Human Services days ago in support of the Protect Life rule. This comes as we're now less than two weeks from the close of the public comment period for the pro-life guideline. In the letter addressed to HHS Secretary Alex Azar, the 140 members of Congress urged the department to finalize the proposed rule, which stops Title X family planning dollars from going to abortion groups like Planned Parenthood. If finalized, it will mean Planned Parenthood will lose up to 60 million of our tax dollars each year, their second largest source of tax funding. President Trump recently issued the Protect Life rule, but it must first undergo a 60-day public comment period. The deadline for the public to comment on the Protect Life rule is July 31st. We are joined now by Representative Ron Estes of Kansas, who led the congressional input on the Protect Life rule. Congressman, thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this, this very important issue. Absolutely. First off, can you tell our viewers exactly what the Protect Life rule would do if finalized? Basically what it does is it restores the family planning rules and regulations back to the way they were when President Reagan was in office, uh, rules that have been approved by, Cong or approved by the Supreme Court. So what it does is it, it prohibits uh, uh, a, a, fiscal, a physical or financial connection between an abortion clinic. It uh, uh, doesn't require family planning to uh, uh, refer for abortions. Uh, it makes sure that we use those monies for real family planning purposes. And it makes sure that uh, as part of that, those uh, uh, facilities that are providing family planning services, uh, that they, they make sure they report instances of sexual abuse or of human trafficking uh, so that we can help protect those victims and those young girls. And we are nearing the deadline for the public comment period. Congressman, what role do the public comments play in getting this Protect Life rule finalized? Yeah, one, one of the things that they want as part of uh, the process for getting the, the rules turned back to the way they should be is uh, getting comments from the public. So we in Congress, uh, there's 139 of us that signed a letter uh, in, encouraging the secretary to, uh, to change those rules to make sure that move forward. We've got till July 31st. Uh, that's when the deadline is for Health and Human Services to receive public comments. Uh, I would encourage everybody out there to, uh, to submit some rules, uh, submit some comments, submit some, uh, some thoughts on how important this is to make sure that we, we protect people and we use those, those family planning dollars for the intent that they had, which was actually helping people with their uh, medical issues uh, from a, from a, from a plan family planning standpoint. Congressman, the letter sent to the HHS Department last week, signed by yourself and 139 other members of Congress, stated that the Protect Life rule increases Title X program accountability and oversight in cases of suspected sexual abuse of minors. Can you expand on that specific aspect? That's right. There's, there's a lot of instances, a lot of uh, discussion out there. In fact, there's been some investigations done by Live Action, for example, uh, that's actually documented cases in a multitude of states where uh, actually the, the abortion provider has actually covered up uh, instances of either sexual abuse or, in some cases, human trafficking. And, and what the rule would require is that all of these abortion providers actually follow the state law in which they operate, which isn't too burdensome, it's not adding new regulations, it's a piece that they should have been doing all along, is making sure that they were following the state law and, and reporting those instances of, of rape or incest or, or human trafficking. Absolutely. Planned Parenthood is calling the Protect Life rule the gag rule. Congressman, I'd like for you to address Planned Parenthood's talking points on this because I know our viewers might face them as well. How do you respond when Planned Parenthood claims community health centers will not be able to fill the huge void if Planned Parenthood is blocked 
from the Title X program. Well, I think that's that's a quite a bit of misdirection there. Is you know the whole intent for the Health and Human Services Family Planning, the whole intent for Title X is making sure that we provide funding for actual real medical treatment, real family planning activities, uh, and funding. And so the funding's not being decreased at all. It's going to be available. It's going to be available for those legitimate operations that want to provide uh, real medical family planning services. And and that's just a, a bit of a misdirection to say that it's not because total funding is going to continue. Representative Ron Estes of Kansas, thank you for your leadership on this issue. We'll continue to update our viewers. Thank you very much for talking about this very important issue. Joining us now in studio is Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and now the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Welcome back to the studio. It's good to be here. It's, Thank you. It's good to see you. First off, what is your reaction to what Congressman Estes just shared with us? I'm so grateful that he's been willing to lead on life. Uh, he's done such a great job with this Title X uh, regulation. Uh, he's pro-life through and through, and he's inspired other members to come alongside. And, and we're so grateful for his work. One part of the Protect Life rule that the congressman hit on is how it will increase accountability and oversight in cases of suspected sexual abuse of minors. What do mm. we know about sus suspected sexual abuse of minors at abortion centers? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm a mother of two daughters, and, and I have seven granddaughters. Mm. Now think of, of where my heart is mm -hmm. on that issue. And, you know, recently I was at a press conference with Lila Rose from Live Action and one of my heroes in Congress, uh, Vicki Hartzler mm -hmm. from Missouri. What an incredible congresswoman she is. Uh, Laura Letterer was there. Mm -hmm. She's a legal expert and a senior advisor, former senior advisor to the State Department on human trafficking. And Laura Letterer, in her role with the State Department, found out that Planned Parenthood is the top destination for victims of trafficking, mm -hmm. second only to hospital emergency rooms. So you think of a young girl that's been trafficked going in for an abortion with no questions asked. I mean, it's a situation that is fraught with all sorts of problems. So we, we are just, you know, along with 50 members of Congress mm -hmm. at that press conference, we were asking Health and Human Services to investigate Planned Parenthood. Take a look at this. When it's about money, when it's about abortion and no questions asked, I think there's such potential for not reporting sexual abuse. And my heart goes out to young girls that I believe have probably been returned to their abuser. And we are closing in on the public comment period mm -hmm. now. The deadline is July 31st. What role does this public comment period play? Will the administration not finalize the rule based on comments? Well, I believe they'll finalize the rule because it's a pro-life administration. We've seen so many good things come from this president. But the important thing is thinking about Planned Parenthood losing 50 to $60 million a year from Title X funding. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you think they're outraged at this rule? Do you think they're going to have much comment about this? Of course they are. Mm -hmm. And we pro-life Americans need to support this administration and comment about how grateful we are for this action from this administration. Uh, let them know that we really do believe that you should separate abortion from family planning. And you know what I always think? Hmm. If you don't do anything, you know there won't be a result. But we who are pro-life need to act out our pro-life beliefs and step up and do an easy thing, comment on how we feel about the protect life rule. It's so simple. It goes a long yes. way. Yes. Marilyn Musgrave, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thank you. President Donald Trump recently issued the Protect Life rule, which stops Title X family planning dollars from going to abortion groups like Planned Parenthood. In fact, Planned Parenthood stands to lose as much as 60 million of our tax dollars each year thanks to this new rule, their second largest source of funding. But here's the deal, before the Protect Life rule can go into effect, it must first undergo a 60-day public comment period. The July 31st deadline is quickly approaching, so pro-lifers, that's where you come in. Listen up for this week's very important call to action. We need you to voice your support for the Protect Life rule. 
Here's how you can do that. Open up your internet browser and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. At this website, you can flood the Department of Health and Human Services with comments to support President Trump's life-saving new regulation. We've made it easy for you and have already crafted a comment for you to submit. If you'd like, though, you can, of course, add your own thoughts to make the comment your own. Once you get to ProLifeWeekly.com, simply enter in some basic personal information. You'll then be brought to the prepared comment and you just have to click Submit. Your message will go straight to the HHS department. The public comment period deadline for the Pro-Life Protect Life rule is July 31st. It's almost here. Let's make our pro-life voice heard now during this comment period. Submit your comment in support of President Trump's Protect Life rule by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Kenya's high court is considering, quote, safe abortion guidelines. The Kenyan constitution legalized abortion in certain circumstances in 2010, but the nation's health ministry withdrew abortion guidelines upon the discovery they were being used to conduct illegal abortions. In North America, the Dominican Republic's Bishops' Conference published a statement last week affirming church efforts to form persons to value and respect life in all of its stages. The bishop stated no one has the right to condemn to death an innocent and much less an indefensible child. The bishop's focus on life comes as various groups press for the decriminalization of abortion in certain cases. And The Guardian is reporting that abortion will be removed from the Queensland Criminal Code within months. The proposed laws will reportedly be brought before the state parliament next month. It would make abortion available up to 22 weeks in the Australian state. In more news, an article in the Wall Street Journal last week spotlighted a topic often ignored in the nation, the alarming abortion rate for African Americans in the United States. Wall Street Journal columnist Jason Riley wrote a piece last week titled, Let's Talk About the Black Abortion Rate. Riley explored how in New York City, thousands more black babies are aborted than born alive each year. And he highlighted how on the national level, black women terminate pregnancies at far higher rates than other women. Look at these numbers. In 2014, black women made up 13% of the U.S. female population, but 36% of all abortions were performed on black women. I spoke on this exact topic, the alarming black abortion rate, with a pro-life leader earlier this year. Pastor Clenard Howard Childress Jr. is senior pastor of New Calvary Baptist Church and assistant to the director at LEARN, the Life Education and Resource Network. He coined the phrase that the most dangerous place for an African-American is in the womb. We go now to our interview with Pastor Childress to hear why. Well, first, it's not hyperbole. It's not a radical rant from a right-wing reverend. It is a sociological fact. 52% mm. uh, of all African-American pregnancies end in abortion, 1,786 a day. And since 1973, over 20 million African Americans have been killed by abortion alone. So it is not uh, anything to be used uh, lightly. Mm. It is a sociological fact and it's happening on our watch and I'm grieved over that. And you are bringing that truth to the urban area, speaking with young people. Tell us about your strategy and your technique. Well, first, with today's young people, just be honest, sincere, and mm -hmm. tell the truth. Don't be afraid of the differences in the generations, but unquestionably, they need to know that they've been lied to. Mm -hmm. And they need to know that this is a great deception that's being played out. And unquestionably, they need to know that it's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Uh, institutions like Planned Parenthood are targeting African Americans, women, as well as men who are a part of the problem also. But when you have a, an, a situation where it's going to affect how your children later on, it's going to affect your ability to have mm -hmm. children, it's going to affect your psychological view indeed on life itself. 
85 percent of women who have abortions have some type of psychological malady. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of pain in our pews and the clergy need to step up and recognize those women are in your pews. You need to shepherd them and sound the alarm of what's happening at the rate of 1,786 a day. And you're doing that as pastor. Yes, you... it has to be. <laughs> right. You were heavily featured in a recent PBS documentary called The Anti-Abortion Crusaders Inside the African-American Abortion Battle. Yes. Let's take a look at it. We're going to talk about the notorious Planned Parenthood. You're being told to go to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood has a plan for you especially you young ladies. Planned Parenthood is taking it far beyond what the Ku Klux Klan ever thought they could possibly take it. What did you make of PBS's frontline portrayal of the pro-life movement within the black community? Well, I was pleasantly surprised at their fairness. Uh, and the key thing of that, one is they said our data is true. Many people believe we're making up the data. And secondly, she noted that Margaret Sanger, the founding mother, so to speak, of Planned Parenthood, was a devout racist. And in this age of political correctness, if a uh, historian who isn't even for the life movement and who is pro-choice, right. Ms. Greenleaf, says, indeed, Margaret Sanger is a racist, then why are we giving out the Margaret Sanger Award? Why is Planned Parenthood insisting that her bus stay in the portrait galley at our Smithsonian? Those are taxpayer dollars going to support that. And in the age, once again, of political correctness and racial sensitivity, <clears throat> why are you upholding a devout racist as a role model for other women and other politicians. It's shocking. And Pastor, talking about abortion is a tough issue on its own. And now we're throwing the race element into it. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for our viewers so they can boldly speak the truth mm -hmm. that abortion is hurting the black community? Well, I often come from the civil rights perspective. I think we all have a common enemy, a common goal, common God. When talking with the African American community, we have to recognize that this is a segment of our community whose rights are being denied. It's the same platform Martin Luther King took. Hmm. We are not holding these truths to be self-evident, uh, that all mankind was created equal, endowed by the Creator, not mom or dad, but God, to certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit. There is a, over 20 million African Americans and over 50 or 60 million since 1973 that were denied the right, the access to the American dream. That's a great social injustice and something that the church should be grieving over. Pastor Clannard Howard Childress Jr., thank you for being here. Thank you for having me very much. When we come back. Her mother, her birth mother was addicted to oxycodone. Even at that point, we thought that this was the child that was for our family. This family points to the Holy Spirit when sharing their story of life, loss, and adoption. Wait until you hear how God has worked in their lives. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A British cabinet minister is reportedly calling on Pope Francis to change the Catholic Church's teaching on contraception. That brings us to this week's Speak Out segment. Member of Parliament Penny Mordaunt is the International Development Secretary, and she is reportedly calling on the Catholic Church to permit artificial contraception. This comes following her recent meeting with the president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, and the Holy See's Secretary for Relations with States, Archbishop Paul Gallagher. In remarks made to the Daily Telegraph, Mordaunt said it's, quote, crucial we engage with faith leaders to help us challenge deeply held beliefs and attitudes. She said the Catholic Church can help us in that. The British minister claims wider access to contraception will prevent deaths due to pregnancy and childbirth complications, especially in Africa. Don't hold your breath, Ms. Mordaunt. One of the many things I love about the church is that she doesn't cave to political pressures or current trends. 
The truth doesn't change with the times. And the church's teaching on sexuality and contraception is a beautiful one. You see, when we separate sex from marriage and life, people become objects. We're not objects. We are made for love and to be loved. Not to mention contraception carries risks with it. The National Institutes for Health reports the pill's failure rates range anywhere from 9 to 30 percent, and 40 percent of women are dissatisfied with their birth control method. The church, in her wisdom, protects us from these risks. The British Prime Minister won't get anywhere in her efforts to lobby the church away from upholding the truth on life, marriage, and sexuality. But hey, now is the perfect time for Penny Mordant to learn the Catholic Church's teaching as we celebrate 50 years since the release of Humana Vitae and the upcoming canonization of Pope Paul VI. Remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's Call to Action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to submit your comment to the Department of Health and Human Services to show your support for the Protect Life rule. A few months ago, speaking at the Susan B. Anthony List Gala, President Trump called onto the stage four-year-old Catherine Alexander. It was an exciting moment for the young girl, but just one small part of her and her family's incredible journey of life, loss, and the Holy Spirit's surprises so far. Take a look at this week's Pro-Life Focus. She is full of incredible energy, spirit, and talent. Most people will never be recognized by the President of the United States. Come on up here, Kathy, come on. Especially not most four-year-olds. She'll be president someday. For the president to call Catherine up was a very, uh, was a shock. President Donald Trump's recent mention of Catherine Alexander's adoption story at the Susan B. Anthony List Gala simply scratched the surface of what this Maryland family has to share. Already biological parents to two daughters and two sons, Bruce and Lisa Alexander first considered adoption after their youngest was born. But it wasn't until the 2012 March for Life when the Catholic couple decided to act. Speaking about adoption and I wanted to know what he thought about it. And that was the same time that he said, you know, I was uh, thinking the same thing. From then on, I, the, the spirit was with us. The fact that things lined up as quickly as they did and what were typical sort of, I don't want to call them obstacles, but typical delays or where the process normally drags on or gets held up, we didn't experience that. The middle-aged parents recognized they were getting a later start than most other adoptive mothers and fathers. That would have been when I was turning 50. And we thought that that was a good age um, to kind of make a break between the infancy program and go to the early child uh, program. So January 14th of 2014, we had come to the decision that maybe we should make that switch. The same day the Alexanders made that decision, the adoption agency gave them a call. She told me, she goes, I know you're interested in maybe switching, but I'd like to tell you that we have a baby girl. Neither one of us needed to take any time. No. You know, we were like, we knew um, that God had just placed this, you know, girl. Even, even at that point, we thought that this was the child that was for our family. Even at the call, it, you know, it was intuitively obvious we were being called. Up until that point, the Alexanders were expecting to adopt a boy. The fact it was a little girl ready for adoption instead was what they saw as a sign from above. In 2009, the couple's oldest daughter, Cody, was riding her bike home when she was hit by a car. Five days later, Cody died at the age of 16. Our older daughter, who is um, with Jesus, you know, in heaven, is who I prayed to and the Blessed Mother. And I had a feeling that Cody had something to do with, with bringing this uh, little girl to our, to our, you know, family. That little girl, though, was born facing an increasingly common challenge, an addiction to opiates. Her mother, her birth mother, was addicted to oxycodone. 
The adoption agency assured the Alexanders Catherine was weaned off her addiction during her time in the hospital. Initially, I'm not going to say it was one of fear. Or it was more of that was just not one that had ever at least crossed my mind. The adoption agency did advise or suggest that we call our pediatrician to see if, um, you know, what they had to say about it. Just to, you know, So I did, you know, and, and what their response was is that there simply just isn't the research. We just thought that um, we, will, we would be provided for, yeah. you know, yeah. if Catherine needed something that, you know, later on in life that was tied with, you know, this addiction, um, that we would handle it. Fast forward to four years later and nothing is slowing little Catherine down. How many seconds? Do you go by Cat or Kathy? Do you go by Catherine? What do you prefer? Um, Peanut. <laughs> Chase and Brandon Alexander have fully embraced their big brother roles yeah. from playing baseball. You ready? Yeah. Pay attention. Good job. To tackling the playground. I wasn't swinging that high until I was in about seventh grade. I remember. These teenagers say their much younger sister brings a renewed energy into their home. A lot of a lot of the new creativity comes from her. <laughs> um, like what are some what are some of the things you like to do with us? Um, goof around. With goof, you. Yeah, we like to goof around, tell jokes, and um, and, and play. And um, wrestle. And wrestle. Yeah, yes. yeah, lots of wrestling. Who wins that one? Me. Really? Yeah, of course. I don't know how she does it, but. With Catherine comes laughter. What's it taste like? Um, strawberry. Strawberry. Oh. That's familiar to this family. It was the wittiness, I thought, that both Catherine and you know, my older sister Cody had that they share, which is really just sort of those, not, not such cracking a joke, but more of like the comment at the right time that is kind of, that you wouldn't expect from a four-year-old, but just kind of fits in right, right with it. It's not coincidence. <laughs> it's not coincidence. Yeah. I have always believed that... Um, that uh, Catherine uh, was heavenly sent, that uh, both Cody and God, um, if you knew Cody, she, she definitely had uh, her way with uh, deciding who was going to come to our family. But I, I do think that she was, uh, she just was heavenly sent. From loss, there have been some tough times in our family, and, uh, but God, that God has always been there to new life. Swimming back is good. The Alexander family can see God's plan at play. Thank you to the Alexander family for welcoming me into your home and for sharing your story with us all. That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, stay connected with us. I'm on Facebook at Katherine Hadro, and if you prefer email, you can reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.